Okay, we're back. It's the one o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Our show today is Global Connections. And the title of our discussion with Carlos Suarez is The Global Perspective on What is Happening in Our Elections. Welcome to Global Connections, Carlos Suarez. Hello, Jay. Aloha. Always a pleasure to reconnect. And um, I'm coming to you now from uh, Cholula, Puebla in Mexico. And uh, as you know, it's been my home now the last couple of years uh, as I'm also with one leg and arm in Texas at times. Uh, normally I'm globe trotting all over the world, but these days, like everybody, staying home. And uh, well, that's just, that's the reality. But here we are. And of course, you know, the United States, uh, wow, God, there's so many things on the plate these days happening. But of course, in barely two months, we now have an election for the president and Congress and many other state and local. And yet the United States being such an important global power, there's keen interest from outside, uh, the, the world is watching, is curious, is confused. And uh, so as I, I think you've laid out uh, in, in the description, we wanna to touch on a, a few things. Some of them are things that we should know and, and sometimes we need to revisit. Uh, other things are maybe just putting them in a comparative context because as it happens, every four years we have the same discussion. The United States comes to learn many people that we have an indirect election of the president and it's not a direct election like most places. You count the ballots, the one with most wins. No, we have this funky electoral college. But let me leave that on the background for now and maybe first want to talk about, because here we are today uh, bringing closure to the Republican National Convention, which is one of the rituals in American politics. Every four years when we have a presidential election, it is a process that, oh my gosh, compared to other places, it seems to go on for years. And it does, quite literally. Uh, the campaigns and the process of selecting you know, the candidates uh, it, it's the primary process. Gosh, think back how long ago was it when we had those huge groups of, uh, let's say, the Democrats this time, or four years ago, the Republicans, when they had, you know, 20 people. Uh, and that process uh, of selecting is done, obviously, by the individual political parties, the two parties in the U.S. system. Uh, and we won't talk about it too much today, but we have to begin just with the understanding that the American political system has two political parties. It is very, very difficult for a third party to gain enough across a national level to be a player. So if you wanna be president of the United States, not only do you have to be 35, naturally born, you have to basically be, well, uh, um, how shall we say, you have to choose A or B. You have to be one of the main parties because if you're an independent third party candidate, you have a big, big hurdle to get enough across the board. So just begin with the two party system. What we have now culminating today is the end of the Republican Party choosing their, or not choosing, but formalizing the process of nominating their candidate. Uh, president Trump is the you know, current president and, and leader of that party, the Republican Party, so he is the obvious nominee. He's being renominated because as to, you know, his term will end in January, so he's hoping to gain a re-election in November, and they go through these rituals. And of course, we're living today in this pandemic era, it has changed everything. Uh, we've had a long, long tradition in, in maybe modern American politics where these conventions were sort of a, a very you know, exciting time for the party activists come together, all the you know, different states are represented. Uh, it goes through the motions over days, very patriotic. Today, given the reality that we couldn't see everybody come together, it's taken online, virtual. So, you know, different maybe, different aspects about that. Maybe some of it is a little bit more choreographed or more tightly controlled. Um, some of it is a little well, bit- What's been going on with Trump this week is, mm -hmm. is, all, is all theater. Mm -hmm. There's nothing left to the imagination mm -hmm. um, except trying to believe what he has to say because it's really remarkable how, how they're all on the same page, but, but uh, that page is not, is not the reality of some other global yeah. world. Well, remember, before becoming president, what was his profession, his job among, you know, head of his Trump organization, a reality TV host. And in some ways, his own uh, presidency and certainly this production right now is that it's something made for television, you know, to sort of give it that feel. Um, it, well, it's you, also you think yeah. back and you compare, compare, um, I'm thinking, I don't know why, but Madison Square Garden, um, filled with people the, the, right up to the last seat. And they're all hooting and hollering and they have signs for their favorite son. Um, and then they go, you know, through this, um, this procedure of calling for the, that state to cast its, ba its, its yes. ballots from its- The state of Massachusetts. And they yeah, give yeah. a roll call, basically. Very right. long tradition. 
And it wasn't always for sure about who would yes. be nominated. There were yes. fights behind the scene, scenes yeah, yeah. and all that. I, those days, I suggest to you, and I would really like your opinion about this, those days seem to me to be over. That this is not a convention along the lines that we have seen in our in our yeah. lifetimes or in many lifetimes before. Yes, um, yes. This this is this is theatrical and it is it is a kind of inefficient, yeah. really very inefficient. Yeah, All absolutely. this trouble, boiling boiling trouble out of Shakespeare, and you already know exactly exactly what's going to happen. Um, yeah. It's almost like why go through this? As you mentioned, you know it takes years to get through this political process. It, it, every every country in Europe is more efficient. I don't yeah. know why. I don't know why we don't clean it up. Anyway, those are my reactions. Well, yeah. I mean, you put it well, and clearly, the other thing, a couple of quick observations is traditionally what happens too. In addition to that roll call and all that, if if a candidate or the the candidates are coming by then, they've had the primary. Sometimes it's clear there's a clear winner. Sometimes it's not, and there's a jockeying that goes on. And it, you know, it's the old image of the smoke-filled cigar rooms, you know, uh, dealing in the background uh, and, and a wheeling and dealing that goes on. And eventually a, a candidate emerges. So indeed, sometimes as they go into these conventions, they don't have a clear candidate. Today we do. We've got Joe Biden who essentially beat out the others. He steps in. And so what is the convention? It's less about substance and let's say program, even though traditionally you have a program that gets discussed and approved. The programs in general tend to be pretty extreme, either very conservative, very little, more than what maybe can be often realistically implemented, but it's a goal, it's aspirational. This time we have so little substance, uh, and even as it turns out for the Republican convention, there's no real new program or platform. It's more or less dusting off the 2016 story. And I think the latest is a slogan, you know, make America great again again somehow and, and then that's kind of a puzzle because well here we are in the middle of a very difficult uh, reality that certainly the president didn't expect to be in uh let's say nine months ago he he uh he's facing now uh you know a challenge on so many levels pandemic uh, the worst hurricane uh, in the gulf right now uh, obviously the whole social protest movement what a mess meanwhile put on the show to sort of distract attention on some level but regardless, uh, this now formalizes the process. Both parties after this now have their candidates in place. In two months time, we will have the election. Um, suffice it to say that in most other parts of the world, you do not have a process that it goes on for so long. Uh, in many of the European countries where there are parliamentary systems of government, it's a very quick process, often a couple of months. Uh, sometimes because there's not always a fixed date for the election, Usually it's within a five year period, for example, they must have a general election, but that can be called sometimes at any given moment. Uh, usually you know by when you have to do it, and so there's a time, but in some cases you often see where they will call an election early through some maneuvers, uh, either to try and solidify more support, and that can work sometimes, sometimes it backfires, like we saw in the UK with Theresa May, she called an election and ended up losing support. Well, very different, very fluid. You know, just very wondering this, this, Carlos, I mean, again, the perspective of countries and people outside the US. Mm -hmm. So what we have is in, the, uh, in the Republican convention is a bunch of family members who are obviously loyal, a bunch of loyal members of the government around him. The, one who, the ones who have survived his, his tests of loyalty, so to speak, over the years. Um, and they're all on the same page, and they're they're all engaging in the same um, distractions and um, disinformation and uh, lying and so forth. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable that that he uh, he tells you he's doing really well on immigration, uh, when in fact he's he, he's busted the chops of so many people. Uh, it's remarkable when he, he tells you that he's done a great job on COVID, when in fact. Uh, a lot of people, including me, feel that he is he is actually complicit in killing 170,000 people and infecting mm -hmm. five and a half million. So um, so he he lies. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, in Europe, they saw um, Hitler as a liar and he mm -hmm. was he was a major liar. He understood how to twist the facts in propaganda, how to repeat a big lie and get the German people who were otherwise relatively liberal in those days to go along with him uh, and to join his team and you know, accept the lies and believe cult-like in the lies. Mm -hmm. Query, this is really an important question. Uh, and I've been reading as background to it, I've been reading 
uh, on tyranny by uh, Timothy uh, Snyder, a history professor at Yale, um, mm -hmm. about the, the comparison uh, psychologically and sociologically and historically uh, between what happened in Europe in the 30s and what's happening now with Trump. So my question to you is, if a leader in Europe, say Western Europe, just for co good comparison, uh, did that kind of lying, you know, big lying, huge big lying and repeated lying, would he or she be able to get away with it or would he be shouted down? Well, I mean, it's a fair question. I think uh, my quick answer, it depends. And I, I say that because I think it depends where in the, which specific kind of country, because Europe is a collection of, well, uh, at least the EU today has 27 member states, but there are many European countries, a handful that are not in that, but leave it at that. The point is that you have some where you have a considerable amount of legitimacy, credibility, a well-informed public, a media that will hold them accountable. I can't imagine something like that happening in, you know, a Denmark or, you know, or a Norway or, or I don't know, even the, uh, well, just naming a few that where you have, I guess, a little bit more credibility and legitimacy of the system. On the other hand, you know, many, uh, many countries are today even under very authoritarian populist leaders, the president of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, the, the prime minister in Poland, uh, in Hungary, uh, to a less degree, Italy, although they've lost, you know, in and out, but, but they, in, even in, in recent past, they had uh, this media mogul uh, Berlusconi, uh, who himself, while not maybe lying on the scale of President Trump, nevertheless, using media, manipulating this information, I guess my point there is that we do see a rise of populism in a handful of countries in Europe. Uh, and those are worrisome trends. And at the local level, you know, the rise of some of those. But yeah, I think you have a fair point in that my sense overall is that the European publics probably are a little bit more vigilant of that and, and to call it for it. But nevertheless, I mean, you have some far right parties that also, you know, carry out a lot of the similar tactics and strategies. And uh, so it, it varies. But more to the point, in most of the European political systems, you would not have a leader like Donald Trump come through the system that way because the parliamentary democracies and the political parties that basically are in them tend to, again, it's a little bit overgeneralized, there are some exceptions, but it tends to be very difficult for somebody to get in from the outside. It's, it's less common. Now, it's not that it's been common in the US either, but of course, Trump has now broken that. He's not a political leader or figure. He comes out of the private business world uh, Europe has had a handful of those, but more generally, they tend to have very, you know, professional uh, politicians who, who, who govern and a, a political culture that has often been maybe more accepting of that, of a political class. Critical, of course, and there's plenty of protests all around. Um, but I think the American ethos, the American ideals, often this idea of the man on horseback, you know, the entrepreneur, the billionaire, for many, and for particularly those who maybe aren't really steeped in a lot of history or or interested in those details, you know, Trump comes across as, well, he tells it like it is, he's different, you know, he's shaking it up. Uh, obviously, when you dig deeper, and even when you talk to even prominent conservatives, increasingly many of them are saying, wait a minute, this guy doesn't represent our ideals and values. He is destroying the party, what have you. So it will vary, but boy, Trump is certainly a phenomenon that is part of, part of the product of the US and the media and, and, and the sort of the emphasis on individualism and, uh, and sort of even these concepts of freedom, you know, freedom to say what you want, to do what you want, freedom from government intervention, et cetera. All of these are puzzles. Um, you know, maybe let me continue quickly. Uh, I had mentioned at the outset, of course, the Electoral College, we, we, we re revisit this all the time. This doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, the United States is rather unique in having an indirect election of its leader, of the president. And it's sometimes complicated to clarify. Most of our viewers will understand it in general, but we just want to remind what we are voting for when we cast a ballot in the fall election is who is going, or, or the state that you live in, which is you know, which delegates are going to be given to them. And uh, every state has a specific number of delegates, which is a formula based on the number of representatives plus the number of senators. So Hawaii has four, you know, California 55, et cetera. And the result is, in 48 of the 50 states, this is where it gets a little messy, 48 of them have a rule that says winner takes all. Whoever wins the popular vote in that state, the political party gets all of those delegates. So in Hawaii, the Democrat candidate Joe Biden will win the majority vote. All four delegates will go to the Democratic Party and they, will, they then will forward the specific 
delegates. There are specific people that are named and they're usually party leaders, insiders, loyal, uh, who have pledged to cast their vote that way. I, let me quickly just say that there are two states, Nebraska and Maine, that don't stick to that. Theoretically, they can choose to divide their, uh, their delegation. I think they only have three, uh, three delegates, but they could choose to go two and one. Uh, they don't often do that, but they could. But anyhow, what I is this? What they may be foreclosed from that. I, I think this litigation, maybe even the Supreme Court, yeah. for the proposition that they are bound, that yeah. they can't, they can't uh, exercise discretion in the matter. That's right. And last time there were some puzzles because a handful of, uh, of the delegates chose not to, not to move forward with Donald Trump and instead put in, I think, uh, John Kasich in some cases, or maybe uh, uh, the other senator from Utah, uh, uh, the protest guy, of course. But here, more, more to the point, what, are, what, are, what, are, what is one of the most important implications of this when we have an election? Because certain states are very solid, either blue for Democrats or red for Republicans. The election ultimately is taking place in six or seven or eight swing states, states that could go either way. And that's where all the energy and resources are being put. Uh, and that's the game. And, and the magic formula is not the popular vote, as we know, in, in the last election. And again, in 2000, it went the other way. The, the, the other candidate uh, who did not get the popular vote won the electoral college vote. So the magic number of 270 is simply a majority of the 538 electoral delegates. And the 538 is 435 reps, 100 senators, plus three additional for the District of Columbia. So you have to get a majority of those delegates that wins the presidency. Uh, it's, how, it's just, how, how is the number of delegates for a given state determined? Uh, it's, a, it's a simple formula, the number of representatives plus the number of senators. So Hawaii has two plus two, uh, Texas has 27 plus two, 29. You know, California, 53 plus two, 55. Mm -hmm. And the idea in general, the idea was in the early, and again, this is the formula from 1787 when they adopted the constitution. Um, many of the states in the South at the time, uh, the Southern states, very small populations, plantation economy, et cetera, they had a fear that by strictly population, the states like Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, they would control the process and, and always have the selection. So it was a way of trying to guarantee some measure of, you know, sort of a compromise, giving some smaller states a little bit more voice. Mm -hmm. uh, the same idea in the Congress. The reason we have the bipartisan, bi, I'm sorry, bicameral, the two chambers, the Senate gives representation equally to every state. So South Dakota has two senators, California has two senators. That's a, you know, part of the formula of, of, of dividing power up a little. Uh, well, again, back to this, I, when you look at it from Carlos, the, a, yeah. a lot of people in this country would like to throw out the Electoral College. They don't, they don't feel it's democratic. And it isn't. No, no. And, and for and, that and, matter, two senators per state is not democratic either. Um, yeah. But, you know. And why, uh, why do we have two Dakotas? Why can't they merge into one? <laughs> just, good just question. Kidding me. <laughs> so, but, but my, my, you know, my concern, my interest is uh, you can have all the polls you want. You can have all the young liberals you want saying to throw out the Electoral College. What's the chance of that happening? Well, uh, I, I, I think the, the, the short version is nil, very close to nothing. It is a constitutional amendment. We haven't had one of those in literally a century. It requires uh, basically all the state, three quarters of the state legislatures, two thirds of the Congress, both houses. Uh, and it, it's just unlikely to happen uh, because there, you know, some would argue that for example, the Republican party has benefited from it more because it has been able to garner the support of a lot of small states, uh, the sort of whole red center of the US uh, versus the more populated coastal, you know, more liberal uh, districts, let's say. Um, and so once you have one party that doesn't wanna change it, good luck, it's not gonna happen. So unfortunately we are stuck with it. And so some analysts say, well, let's put the best spin on it. It is, you know, it is what it is, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately in the modern, era, because I don't think the founders knew in 1787, you know, that we would have social media networks and television and all this. Uh, today, it does become, ultimately, it becomes a game uh, in those swing states, which are a specific handful, and they often are the same ones for a while. You know, they, it's remarkable. You know, just a Woody Allen thought, <clears throat> I like to have Woody Allen thoughts. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's just like the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. It's the same notion. If I could go back to 1787 and explain to those guys what's happening this year, 
<laughs> they would they would be so interested and they would change some of the things they've been they were thinking about and it would be a, a grand service to them if they could only have somebody tell them what the future would really bring <laughs> yeah quite a quite a puzzle and you know i'm thinking there often our shows there's one I've, i watched recently on netflix called outlander where they go like and this woman goes back in time to ireland or scotland i think blah 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 uh, but the other thing to say real quickly, I wanted before I forgot, I wanted to mention about the, the electoral college situation. Let me think of what it was. Uh, that is, um, it, um, gosh, how can I put this? Let me think, I'm trying to phrase it in a different way. Um, oh gosh, I'm having a brain fart. It just, it, right now it escaped me what I wanted to say. I'll come back to it in a moment. But um, I think, uh, you know, I can't underscore how much of a puzzle it is for the outside world too, that every four years is like, wait a minute, uh, Hillary Clinton got 3 million more votes, but Donald Trump got the office. And it just, it, it, you have to kind of wrap yourselves around that. Uh, it isn't easy to understand. Uh, here, here's what I was just remembering that in many ways, back in 1787, the founders, uh, and we have lots of essays and documents they wrote, the Federalist Papers, you know, Hamilton, John Jay and others, sure. um, they had a real fear of democracy uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the way that they did not believe that the average person, the average citizen that today, of course, we all assume, yes, I am a person, I have a vote, my vote counts. But in 1787, certainly those leaders that were forming and writing this constitution, they did not want to go outside and let everybody have a single vote. And so the indirect election was a way of kind of saying, no, let these representatives they will hear the voice and they will have a you know input from you know the population, but ultimately these party insiders, or they, they weren't called that, but these maybe, you know, educated uh, uh, civic responsibility people, they would move forward and cast the vote. And theoretically, again, the idea is that they could choose to, you know, at the end of the day, because let's remember, let me maybe clarify this. The election is November 3rd. Uh, the delegates actually formally cast their vote in December. There's a time somewhere in the middle of December where formally they have to do it now in the pandemic time. I don't know if it's going to be done online or by mail or what. That'll be interesting to see. But normally, they literally go in Washington, D.C. to an office where they cast their vote, these delegates. And, and then that formalizes it. And then the following January, whatever it is, the 20th or so, is the inauguration, the transfer of power. Uh, never mind that we're, you know, here, uh, before I forget this, uh, in a comparative perspective, too, we are facing an election today like we have not seen in the United States where the entire system and the credibility and legitimacy of the outcome is going to be at stake. And I can predict with a pretty high degree of certainty, we're not going to know the outcome the next day on, on Wednesday. Uh, there's probably going to be some, you know, fuss and fight and legal battles. Uh, hopefully it won't take more than days or weeks, but it's very likely that we're going to see some of this. And you can already see Trump and some of the supporters, specifically the president, kind of setting it up for that allegations of you know mail fraud and so on and, and then the, the mail postal service and, and all the challenges there if, if i win it'll be a legitimate election if i yes. lose it'll be a rigged election exactly so, so i have to win yeah yeah and and again when when asked that i mean it's astonishing that a president a sitting president cannot say of course i will abide by the results of the you know i mean by by saying that we'll wait and see is already stirring more confusion and, and eroding legitimacy and trust. And it's setting up a, a future saying, see, I told you so, we knew, and da -da, everybody knew, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's astonishing, because uh, again, the United States has had a very stable political system overall. I mean, it's had social turmoil, it had a civil war, etc. But we've not had an election in the recent past where the stake uh, is so prominent of the legitimacy, the credibility, uh, the accusations of fraud, and so on. Uh, we're likely to see that. And let's hope it doesn't also uh, get uh, revealed in, in massive violence, because that's a potential as well. We've had, look, in these last days, another incident there in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, violence in the streets, protest movements that are continuing. Um, it could get ugly. Uh, he's, he's, he's already said he's going to send troops there. This, which is, uh, that sounds like martial law to me. So it, it's a mess. And then uh, add to that uh, the foreign uh, entanglement by what we know the Russians are meddling once again. Uh, will it be as effective or just more chaos and, and you know, particularly with social media? Uh, so these are strange times we are living in and, and, and uh, a little bit worrisome, very worrisome for some. Increasingly, you know, 
uh, not just the, the fringe margin uh, questioning it, but many, many credible sources saying, look, our democratic institutions are really uh, at stake on the line. And it will be difficult to bring back trust and credibility as we get through this. It's not gonna be easy. Well, after the war, you know, this was the greatest generation, set the liberal world order for all these years, the Marshall Plan, you and I have talked about that before. Um, and I can imagine a lot of countries, a lot of people have grown up uh, in that thought um, that the U.S. Uh, has led the world in, in, in a moral approach, uh, in, in a liberal world order, um, in democracy. Democracy equals the U.S., right or wrong. That's the way a lot of people in this world, the, the seven or eight billion people in this world have seen us. Uh, under Trump, that obviously hasn't, hasn't been the case. And He's, he's turned in on himself and isolated and gone nationalistic and populistic and all that. But um, this election and the, the kinds of phenomena that you describe, I wonder how people feel about that. If I were living again in Western Europe and I saw this sort of thing happening, this confusion and all these remarkable statements about he's not going to be bound by the election and so forth, I would be, I would be terrified that this is the last, the last leg of the uh, liberal world order yeah. and it's falling apart. It's on yeah. fire. Uh, I mean, am I right about that? How oh, absolutely. And, and some of it is generational. Obviously the Europeans, particularly, particularly Europeans who, who are, let's say over 50 or 60, who understand you know, the, the legacy of the Cold War, the legacy of the World War. Younger populations, I think as they are in many places tend to be a little bit less, uh, you know, less historical in their grounding. Uh, but I can imagine and, 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 and I can assure you that there are many uh, Europeans who are looking at this and shaking their heads because even uh, not just the democracy that is eroding, but uh, this obviously this global pandemic crisis, the United States should be the leader, should be as traditionally looked upon. And now even in the last 24, 48 hours, we have the CDC coming out with some new guidelines that are really just eroding its credibility. This is the premier public health agency of the world. Uh, that together with the World Health Organization should be leading the, this and, and instead it's being politicized. So again, the world is looking, I think, very wearily and I, I don't pretend to say that I know the world's perspective, but certainly the elites and those who understand and plug in and follow American politics are dismayed and, and, and just quite uh, uh, confused and, and really disappointed because it's difficult to explain, and, 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 and yet again, it's not as if it doesn't exist in other places. Europe has its share of populism and, and the rise of some of these same pressures. But uh, I think uh, it, it, it's remarkable to see, I think, the United States political culture on display in a way that is eroding our credibility in the world. Uh, yeah, you know. so over the past few years, and I'm sure this has taken a toll, um, I'm sure that uh, Angela Merkel and Macron uh, they both uh, don't think much about Trump and uh, they don't like him much. And I think uh, their followers in their respective countries don't like him too much. And the question I, I put to you is, um, you know, we haven't seen the end of this. If he wins, <clears throat> there'll be more of the degradation of respect. Uh, one, um, one writer for an Irish newspaper uh, came up with this notion about it's, it's time to pity the United States. Um, and that really has caught on. I think um, that people in Europe pity the United States now. And, and ultimately it's a question of whether they will, will they continue to treat us uh, with the kind of respect they have in the past mm -hmm. in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of foreign policy and in, in terms of global trade uh, and in terms of the reserve currency. And I, I suggest to you, uh, Carlos, that going forward, if he wins again, um, those things will further deteriorate almost immediately, and we will lose what we the what we have left in terms of world leadership. What do you think? Well, absolutely, there are definitely clear signs of that, uh, and uh, um, and again, uh, it, it's the kind of thing that it's on one hand it's, it's difficult to measure and quantify, but we know it's there. It's also difficult to see. Well, how do you how do you fix it? How do you get beyond that? Um, I think it also coincides with the United States kind of having to come to terms with uh, even irrespective of Trump and, and this current, you know, let's say aberration, the United States losing relative power and having to come to terms with a changing world where we must become more humble, more, uh, you know, we need a seat at the table. There's no question about that. We don't have it right now. And when we show up, 
we sort of elbow everybody and you know make a mess. Uh, but the United States needs to see that that table as a partner, as a you know, as a uh, inspiration. Today, sadly, uh, many of the ideals that the United States at times tries to promote, you know, democracy, freedom, liberties. Uh, look at what's happened in Belarus. We have no feedback or input or, or statement from the U.S. government about that. Uh, what's happening in China? Again, similar, you know, situation there. There's a trade war, but there's not a lot of attention to the sort of the, the democratic deficit there. Uh, and instead, we've seen now, uh, sadly, uh, 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 our current leader in the U.S. praising dictators uh, and, and coddling up to them in ways, and then completely attacking and eroding trust and personal relationships with democratic leaders, traditional allies. So we're in, in, a, in a strange environment. It's gonna take time uh, to, and, and so yeah, you can imagine one scenario if we have continuity four more years, more erosion of that same. It's not gonna get better. Uh, the US will continue to be more and more isolated and marginalized. And I can just imagine, uh, you know, Macron and, and Merkel who probably talk several times a week on a regular basis and meet each other every few weeks uh, just rolling their eyes, like counting and hoping that, you know, the U.S. can move beyond this. Otherwise, they also know that they, if they have to deal with it, you, by now, uh, enough experience how you deal with it. Somehow, you know, keeping a certain distance, being very careful, monitoring the Twitter war, because it's, for Trump, it's all about that. Uh, and, and the unpredictability, the chaos, it is, uh, it's, it's nerve wracking for anybody. Uh, imagine preparing for a meeting with Trump, you know, how, how do you brief uh, your, your leaders, your, your staff, you know, um, it, it's a different strategy from, from traditional times when, you know, countries came together with their interests and the traditional negotiation and diplomacy is, let's find a win-win solution, we can all benefit, let me understand your interests and make sure that you get what you need and vice versa, not today, we have a zero-sum transactional president who can say one thing in the morning and tweet something else in the afternoon. And uh, that's not an easy way to negotiate across borders to carry out diplomacy. No, you, you wind up with a, a kind of uh, bankruptcy, uh, including business bankruptcy, but beyond business bankruptcy. So my last question to you, Carlos, is actually the one that interests me most. Aside from the perspective of other countries, other leaders, the populations of other countries in, in Europe and elsewhere, what about the US? You've described some social political processes that are profound. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether the American voter, the American electorate, including the base, I suppose, maybe they're in an important group to distinguish here in dealing with this, whether they understand this. They understand the way other countries feel about us, how the relations have degraded, how their perceptions of American government, American democracy, American fairness and morality have changed. What about the people here in this country? I mean, again, a little crass to say this, but the short answer is that most people in the US, most Americans don't have a lot of interest, awareness, knowledge of foreign perceptions of the US. Uh, never mind foreign policy, which itself is complicated and messy but the view that others have of the US. And, um, you know, there's a small group that yes, do travel and anybody who does global travel knows that, you know, the, the images, the stereotypes of the ugly American, but unless you're literally, uh, you know, a foreign policy junkie, you are not likely to be aware of this. Now, the Pew Research Center, very prominent research, uh, you know, think tank in, in, in the US, uh, regularly publishes uh, uh, reports and analyses on foreign perceptions of the US. Uh, and I myself, most recently, I, I teach every couple of years a course uh, at HPU on images from abroad, the perception of the U.S., different places. And so when we have seen over the years these regular studies, uh, it's suffice it to say that we are at a point today where many parts of the world look down upon the U.S. in a way that has just never been seen before, uh, a very negative perception. Uh, there's some interesting variation. There are a few places where the president remains very popular, the Philippines, you know, parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, a couple of Middle East countries, uh, but by and large, and for the most part, it has been a pretty steady erosion under the current president. And again, uh, you know, while he may, you know, have made it more than it might otherwise have been, in some ways, he also reflects trends that were going on already. Uh, the U.S. has been disconnected more and more, for example, with Latin America, a region that is so important and so deeply connected, but effectively, the United States has neglected it. Uh, it has not been nurturing the relations in ways that maybe 25, 30 years ago, there was all this outreach, you know, NAFTA and promoting, you know, trade uh, and even, you know, defending human rights, promoting democracy. Today, no, nah, uh, not, not much. 
other other places again it will vary but uh, the us is no longer calling the shots in the way that it might have been 20 30 years ago and i think uh, you know, that that's where we are now where it, 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 the world is now seeing that and the us is no longer having the influence it might have had in the past um, a final note, let me just say this, that irrespective of all this, the United States still remains a very powerful force for soft power. And what we mean by that is maybe cultural appeal, you know, the role of popular culture, music, you know, television, uh, uh, et cetera, you know, uh, cinema, uh, and even just the attraction that despite criticism people may have all over the world, it still is a place that attracts many of the best and brightest, many of the hardest working. Uh, and although the pandemic has certainly put a pinch on that, I think it's fair to say that the United States will continue to be a country that draws people for the opportunities, for the connections, uh, et cetera. You know what we say in Spanish about that? Uh, <laughs> from your lips to God's ears. Carlos Suarez, a professor at the uh, University of uh, the Americas in Puebla, New Mexico, uh, also associated with HPU. HPU, there in Hawaii. And whose middle name is Fulbright, because he's been on so many, so many Fulbright <laughs> uh, uh, scholarships all over the world. Thank you so much, Carlos. It's great to talk to you. Look forward to our next Aloha. Discussion. Aloha.